Welcome in this new podcast episode. Today I'm talking to Elizabeth Dulling. Welcome, Elizabeth. Um, thanks for having me. Nice to be here. So um, I've been connected with you um, via the practitioners, the Indian Development Goals Practitioner Network. Um, we had a short conversation last week or the week before. Um, and I, I wanted to talk to you because you know a lot about learning and also about what you what your work was what you did so i'm really interested in and um let's let's first go with this inner development goals what attracted you to the inner development goals um so it was something that i'd been vaguely aware of the idg so a friend of mine had mentioned them on and off i think over the past year and i think i was already on the email list but i hadn't ever actually taken the time to look and to engage um, and then the reason I uh, started to get more involved was because the same friend had some free tickets to the online track of the conference in Stockholm, which was lost track three, four weeks ago. Um, so I came along to that. And I think I looked, literally printed them off five minutes before the conference and just looking at them then could see that it, it essentially was a map that it goes beyond some things I'm doing, but a lot of the work that I'm already doing was already was on there. Um, particularly if I look at something like design thinking, which is one of the things I'm, I'm involved in facilitating, uh, the, a lot of the key skills that we cultivate through design thinking were already on the map. So I think that made sense. And then ex the experience of the conference really confirmed that for me, that this was a tribe of people who cared about a lot of the same, a lot of the same things. Although the did, what I did notice was that a lot of people are connecting it to a much, much bigger picture than I am in the sense of global systemic economic issues, which aren't so much the things that I work on. I think um, I mentioned this before, right, that I have I've been involved in kind of global and regional reporting and evaluation research with UNICEF. So that's obviously big scale, but it's focusing very much just on learning. So in terms of the SDG map, just under SDG four, whereas it was clear that a lot of people involved in the IDGs are thinking much more broadly in terms of the whole SDG map and how the IDG map links with that. But in terms of the micro, I could just see, okay, these are the skills I care about. What I've noticed here in the Netherlands specifically is that in the university space, probably also higher education, um, it really um, got traction. So there's a couple of universities who integrated the IDGs as, as they called, into their learning of some of their programs. Um, mm -hmm. Like there's one in Windersheim, Swolle, who um, they have now, I think it's a second year, they've integrated into their honors program. It's really interesting how they have like a journal now and they journal every time uh, after class or they look for um, meditation, um, they look for uh, turning within, in the being um, domain. With your experience on learning and education, why do you think it, it, it's picking up so fast in these areas? I think that's really encouraging. I didn't know that because I'm I'm new to the IDG, so I'm not yet, I'm, I've got a lot to learn in terms of where it's gaining traction and not and which domains etc but that's particularly encouraging for me to hear because my take on this is that I actually began in in primary education because I wanted to, to teach um when I graduated and I again I wouldn't have had the language for this but I knew instinctively I didn't want to be in a subject silo so I'd done a history degree and I didn't want to teach history every day as you would in a high school so I went for primary because I knew I wanted to teach across subjects and, and I wanted to use um, the arts and, you know, creative thing, you know, be able to do music and art and things like that. Um, so coming back to your question, I think many in, in many ways that map of the IDGs fits very naturally with early years because the education there is very holistic. Like we all know that children learn through play, that they that they need to become emotionally literate, that they need to, you know, not just be numerate and, and literate, but have all these other skills to navigate the world. And then that understanding kind of slips away as we move up through the age group. So it's interesting if you're in a school where it's all on site from the primary through to the secondary, you can often see that. Obviously, it depends on you know the nature of the curriculum and the nature of the school. But generally speaking, 
a lot of the more um, emotionally engaging activities, the more creative activities, all those more holistic factors of learning tend to drop away. And we go up into that to our heads. We focus on analysis. We focus on I mean, hopefully critical thinking and creative thinking, but very much a uh, an emphasis on the intellect and and even more so then as we go into tertiary education. So that's why it's great to hear if you're saying that it's being picked up at university, because in many ways that of the, of the sort of mainstream education from primary, secondary, tertiary, that would be the one where it might be the most difficult to integrate. Mm. Um, But it depends on the system. I don't know the Dutch system very well. So I would imagine in some, some systems it's easier to absorb it than others, depending on the way, things are taught but if we go back to the old school lecture theater style of tertiary education it's going to be very difficult to integrate those things because people essentially aren't activated they're passive and then their response and their action is just to write and to think and to argue but not necessarily to move around this map that the idgs gives us there is um tomorrow we have the local meetup um in my area mm-hmm and I've invited a professor from another university, um, Sakshil and Davider, and he is on the. Um, he has two topics where he's, where he's been uh, teaching, and also um, his uh, what is it, lecturate? I think it's called. Um, mm-hmm. It's brain and technology. Okay. And so that's I think it's first of all already a really interesting um, topic to have a conversation. And I had a conversation with him on the podcast too, but I you know I invited yeah. him to speak on this. But now he has also applied for a grant for a succion for the university to mm-hmm. integrate the inner development returning inner for students um starting next year. And he has called it from SDG to IDG to SDG. So the idea is um the IDGs came, of course, um, if you know the story, from mm-hmm. the idea that SDGs are not going, the sustainable developments are not going fast enough. So we need to start with inner work before we can start with the external work. And then yeah. once you've done it, of course, you go back to the external work and to make a change. So that's the idea of SDG to IDG to SDG. Right. Yeah. And I've, I've I really love this topic, so I I invited him to come and and invited schools in my area, but it's. I, I was hoping for more for more attendees, but it's a it's the way it is, and I, I am okay with that. So even if there's like six people and we have a great time with six people, and these people mm-hmm. learn from him and think about how they can implement in their school, we have one. I mean, we have, mm-hmm. we are pushing with the next step, so that's okay. Yeah. So um, what I see is really what you said: the, the moving from the brain from to the brain. That was that was what was happening in the past. It's still, of course, going on. But now we see that the, the, the more freedom students are getting to really determine what do I want to learn? What is mm-hmm. it that I really want to accomplish with my education instead of just, so here's the curriculum, you have to follow it and just do. instead of And then, no, I, what is it you really want to learn? What are the practical things you want to learn? And what companies you want to go to to study? So I think it's it's really interesting, this part that I like a lot. Mm-hmm. There was one thing because I, I always go through LinkedIn, and this time um, you you you're, you're going to build a website of your work, so but it's not there yet. So the mm-hmm. the only place I can really look for your information was LinkedIn. So and there's one interesting part that I love a lot on your LinkedIn resume is that you had a um, a pause, I could say, <laughs> maybe from your career, not from your life, of course, but from yeah. your career, um, t- to be a mom and. I, I think it's wonderful. Um, also, that you just put it on there, um, and but you also did a lot of things in that time. What, what, what did you learn specifically? Not specifically from your family, but what did you learn specifically in that in that career break? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so I think I learned the importance of community, definitely. Um, so making a decision like that to take a, a break from the workplace uh, is a big one. And I remember, I think it was a struggle for maybe the first year, 18 months. That was a big shift to no longer have my identity, my work identity, right? To walk away from that for a while. And I think 
it can be very lonely and I think therefore it's so important to have community and I was very fortunate to have that you know just to have you know a peer group who had made similar decisions and were taking a break or slowing down to be with their children over that period um I think in some ways that's easier because we happen to also be expatriates at that time so in that in that window um which was basically 10 years out of the workplace in, in terms of paid work but only probably five years off and then four or five years doing a master's very slowly which was the way I kind of warmed back up to the workplace but because we were in that particular um demographic it was easier in many ways I think because there were other internationals around in a similar situation who had chosen to be with their kids and therefore were available and we could we could really do it together um so I think that's that's one of the first things I learned um I'm just trying to remember the specifics so Swaziland now Eswatini um and Namibia and Sierra Leone yeah so those were the the countries that we were in over that period um I, I think it's a great privilege for a start I think it's important to say that I think um it's not always possible and I think there are a lot of people who might have made that choice who don't necessarily get to do it. So I, I do think that's the first, I was very aware of that. Um, it was something I wanted, we both decided that's what you know we wanted to do. So I think it's a privilege to do it. Um, and also to be able to learn. So I really enjoyed doing the masters and not having to juggle as most people have to do with a full-time job at the same time. Um, so that worked really well and it complemented, I guess what you'd call the hard work and the practical work of parenting um, to kind of, keep keep the brain work going or you know reactivate it um I think another thing I learned which which is relevant for me now as I get a bit more involved in coaching is that it can have a big cost in terms of confidence into in the professional world so taking a break like that you you know you come off the treadmill you come off the kind of natural flow of growth that you would have in the workplace and I think it can be a challenge to go back. Um, for me, the master's really helped with that because I loved what I was doing. I, that was in educational and social research, but specifically I focused on creativity in my dissertation, which actually then has informed everything I've done since. So it was a real turning point, which again, I may not have stumbled on if I hadn't had the privilege of studying at that point. So um, I think the confidence is a big one. And I have met quite a few people since then who've, who've talked about that in the same way that it's it's, it can be hard to go back. And then I think that's where, you know, some things I've learned through design thinking particularly can be really helpful because the emphasis is on, you know, experimentation and exploration and trying things and not being the expert and the beginner's mind and all these, uh, essentially cultivating creative confidence is what I've realized is, is my main interest. So it's interesting that that came out of an experience that, that, you know, knocked my professional confidence for a while. Yeah. Mm. Uh, just to be clear, um, I said I love it, um, mm. and 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 said since you're a mom, but it, mm. I, I I feel the same way when when a guy when a, a man yeah. does that, yeah, a yeah. father does that. So that's it. Yeah. It's, it's nothing to do with that. You being a mom, it's just to make the, the deliberate decision yeah. as a as a couple to do yeah. it in this way, to set up in this way. And and you're right, it is a privilege because you have to you have to have some way to have enough money with the to to live. From one income yeah uh, um why did think, you oh, sorry i just remember another thing i realized actually and it took me a long while to realize this is as i say i want something i wanted to do obviously like any job it had its frustrations but i i basically really enjoyed it but one thing i i realized at the time and and, and subsequently is that because my whole kind of raison d'etre is people development then it's really interesting for me right to raise humans because it it's a lot of what i'm already interested in but i do very much understand that people who come from a completely different world like if you're a nuclear physicist or i don't know any job that doesn't particularly involve <laughs> developing people um i can see why you'd make a different decision so i don't think it's necessarily for everyone and i think it's quite personal and i don't think it, it's you know a template for what everyone has to do but i do think that was one of the reasons i enjoyed it but it took me a while to kind of make that that connection yeah why did you decide to, to do the masters um, for firstly, practical reasons. So we were in the kind of UN world. My husband at that point, he, he was, was a UN staff member. He works in child protection. And what seemed like a logical step for me to do next was to get involved in that world because there's quite a lot of obstacles often as an accompanying partner in terms of the local economy, whether it's your visa status, whether it's the languages. Um, so it made sense. And I was very interested to be involved in that world. But 
having a master's is is essential really for any consulting roles with the UN and it was something I had never done it, it wasn't again this might be just a distinctive feature of the UK education system which may have changed it wasn't emphasized at all when I did my first degree and pretty much it was the people who couldn't decide what to do next who did a master <laughs> most of us you know most people went straight into the workplace so it was something I'd never done and it just seemed a really good way to as I said warm back up for the workplace build my confidence again and um and and get some clarity in terms of what exactly I wanted to contribute I knew that my background had been a combination of education and then intercultural training in, in the private sector so I knew that people development would be the theme but it it gave me the space and time to clarify exactly what I wanted to do when I went back to work hmm. yeah what is it that attracts you so much in people development then I think it's potential and untapped potential and and that um sense that there's there's so much more to a person that meets the eye and and also that our environments I mean, some of this I've learned subsequently and, you know, on the master's, master's through delving deeper, but particularly thinking about it through the lens of creativity, there's a lot of ways that our potential is shut down by our environments, whether that's a conventional education system. Um, and, and this is no disrespect to teachers having done the job. I think it's a it's a really tough job and I, I have a lot of respect for teachers, but there's all sorts of factors in an industrial model of education that weigh against fulfilling people's creative potential and then and again in the workplace right as we know I think some of that was touched on in the IDG conference so I think that's the appeal for me is seeing pretty much in every person that there's a lot of potential that has been either untapped or actively squashed by the systems that they've been in and I and I enjoy creating environments to open that up again um I mean there's there's some interesting metrics for example of the number of questions you may have heard this before the number of questions we ask so a four or five year old I'm not going to be able to remember the statistic I think it might be an average of 100 a day which is obviously a kind of index of curiosity and and critical thinking that and that literally tanks you know it's a linear graph down to 18 so that's just one example um and so I think for me the appeal is putting that process into reverse um, and putting people back in touch with the creative confidence that most of us had as a four or five year old. One of the very simple things I often do is to get people in a workshop to draw the person next to them, which brings up all sorts of you know fears and oh, I'm so sorry, I'm not an artist. This is a disaster. This is terrible. I can't show you. And then just ask them, you know, what do we hear from you all? And why are we hearing that? And how do you think it's different if we ask a bunch of five year olds? And people get it immediately. They say, well, they'll just do it because they're all artists. They don't care. So, you know, it's a very simple way of showing people the way that their creative confidence has been knocked um, or eroded by, you know, these different systems that, that we've been in. So I think that's the real appeal for me is digging that back up. It's almost like I, I did history, but I see it a bit as archaeological work, you know, digging, digging that stuff back up. So mm. what do you do yourself to, um, well, increase your creative confidence i think that's really been informed by what i've learned particularly about uh in in design thinking is i think a lot in terms of head heart and hands both when i design any sort of learning experience and and again in my own life and i think for me the key to building creative confidence is keeping those three in motion um so i think I have a predisposition to reflect and also to to feel, you know, I'm quite emotionally orientated, but I'm not always, I wasn't historically action orientated as much as I would have liked. And I think for me, that's the, the key piece that I've learned and that I'm very aware of applying is to keep the action going, not to reflect too much, analyze too much. We, those, those processes are really useful and, and any creative process includes them, but I think one of the key insights of design thinking that I try to apply is that we learn by getting feedback from the world. So that's from other humans out in the world by trying something. Try stuff is one of the mantras. Um, so the power of experimentation, um, a willingness to make mistakes or to, to even not frame things as mistakes, you know, but to learn through doing and through trying. Um, so I think that's one of the key 
insights that I apply more than I would have done if I hadn't kind of been exposed to this whole like body of thought and action that is, and it's not just design thinking, but I think that's probably when, when I did the lit review for my master's on, which was really about the intersection between creativity and learning. That was the piece that really stuck out to me as being more practical, well, easier to explain, easier to facilitate and easier to apply and really reclaiming those kind of creative behaviors as something that's essential to being human rather than something that's for the special people with the magic dust who sit, you know, in the corner looking arty and being graphic designers or whatever we think of, you know, capital C creatives, that that's actually something that's in our DNA, all of us. Um, and I find design thinking is a, a very practical way to reignite that. Yeah. I'm thinking of Leonardo da Vinci now. I'm mm -hmm. not sure exactly why, but it's just, image came yeah. up with me right so what i i can imagine but i'm just testing this with you and to give me feedback yeah. is that because of the the way that people learned in those days um by being like apprentice and um doing the actual work um uh doing the analysis analysis of of the works of others um sculpturing and that 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 that's really helped people like him to become these great artists in various um materials i would say mm -hmm. yeah the way that we've specialized in the industrialized world um gives leaves little space for us to do this what would you do to bring this back to bring um this creative part back to well young people in, in while, while you're studying and young i would say anybody also when you left school like a young professional yeah. as well because yeah. i think it, the time is uh, longer when we could yeah I, I mean i think it, it's just and again i think systems vary a lot i think the netherlands may be much stronger at this actually than the uk because you have a my right you have a whole vocational track which is very strong from quite early on um or uh, similar to germany i'm not sure i don't know the detail but i i think one of the first things to say is to value pra practical work as much as intellectual work um i think that's one of the things that i find a shame is how intellectual work and knowledge work is privileged above other things often in systems and I think that's a mistake um but I think from from even the secondary school high school age that's something that's very important to explain to young people and encourage them to do is to get experience in the real world of actually go and help someone go and observe someone go and try something out rather than assuming that just because it sounds interesting or because it's prestigious or because it earns well you know all the the, the classic reasons why kids pick jobs or pick subjects that actually it's so important to try it and to see whether you actually enjoy the activity of the work so um and obviously practically that's things like you know job shadowing work experience a, a lot of those already happen but I think they happen it's very nominal often I mean it might be a day a day of your high school career I think it was a week of my high school career um, and it's not enough to really experiment. And, and it didn't, it wasn't accompanied by, for example, interview, doing an empathy interview with the person who does that job to really understand it. You know, what is your typical day? What do you love most about this work? What do you hate about it? What do you wish you'd known when you were my age? You know, those kinds of questions, I think I would have really loved to have known about. And I actually did a work experience in accountancy as a, a 14, 15 year old because I was good at maths, but absolutely hated it. But all it was was a stock take. I mean, it was literally going to a warehouse and counting boxes, which was really boring and I hated it. And obviously there's far more to accountancy than that. So hmm. if it had been accompanied by an empathy interview, I think it's both, right? It's the people side of really engaging with the the people who are doing that to, to, to understand their lives, understand their pain points, understand their joys in that path, but also getting some practical experience. Um, so that would be high school. And then at university level or tertiary level, there's much more potential, I think, to get involved as an intern and actually do the work, um, which is more difficult, I think, if you're under 18, but to to be in the workplace and understand that you, money isn't necessarily your main goal at that point. You really need the experience 
to know whether this is going to be the right path for you. But I think the other thing also, and this is again comes from design thinking or particularly from designing your life, which came from Stanford, um, Bill Bennett and Dave Evans applied design thinking to this process of wayfinding initially for Stanford undergrads. And then it's since, you know, expanded to, to cover just about everybody. But um, the point they make is also to take off this pressure that you will find this one path or that you've got to work really hard about finding this path and then sticking with it for the rest of your life, that that's very outdated. You need to find what interests you and what you care about and start building useful skills. But I think something they have in common with also people like Cal Newport, who's a technologist, but he's very interested in the workplace and technology and, and all sorts of things in terms of how we find our way. But they both have in common this they don't like the passion narrative. And I may be sort of pushing against a lot of the IDG people here, but they don't think it's helpful because people often have either no passions, in which case it's not helpful because there's nowhere to go with it, or loads of passions, um, loads of interests. I mean, I'm more like that. I'm interested in a lot of different things. Um, and putting and often I think it's it's helpful to flip that narrative and see that experience, hands-on experience, developing a craft, and going back to what you're saying. Craft, thinking of it more as craft, craftsmanship, developing a useful and preferably, un, if not unique, a scarce skill is that that route to mastery is followed by passion and joy often. Um, and it's not the other way around. It's a bit like the tiger mother, right, with the violin playing and all that misery. The point that you're not going to you don't always enjoy something until you're good at it. Um, so you can't pick a passion necessarily if you haven't really experienced something. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense to take that pressure off young people to find their passion and see it more as go out and experiment, but do experiment. Don't just think, go and experiment and interview people and try stuff. And that will, will be a more helpful path. Yeah, that's my take, I think, on that. I think see a lot of young people now taking like a gap year or maybe even two while they're studying. I think that's a mm -hmm. great um, opportunity to learn from so many other things than just school. Mm -hmm. Even though... Um, millennials, uh, uh, people like me, older people think that they're lazy and um, don't want to work. Uh, I think it's just, I think it is a great way to learn. Um, and also, if you are like an apprentice, um, if you want to be an apprentice and want to learn the craftsmanship, the, the changes that we need in companies is also necessary because then people would need to spend time to educate young people unexperienced people instead of just going like, oh, no, I, I have my work that I need to do. I have efficiency and I need to, I need to mm -hmm. do so many pieces, so many things in a week or in a month or whatever. And I have no time to do this. Well, if you, if you think back, this is what you really wanted to have when you were younger. I think it's a great time yeah. to give back, but you also yeah. need to get like the opportunity from the company to do that. Right. Yeah. I agree. And, and I think maybe there, again, that's where um, designers are very keen on re reframing things. And I think the the relevant reframe there is on efficiency. OK, so the starting point is that creativity is not efficient, full stop, unfortunately. OK, so that's a reality. I'm very interested in the creative process, you know, whether it's in the artistic domains or in the workplace and, and particularly how we can learn from the more artistic domains. But um, it is not the linear route from A to B and it's not efficient. So I think that's the problem right there. And, and that's where the the learning or, or the education of, as you say, the older generation in the workplace is really important to, well, firstly, probably the empathy, as you say, to think about like, what would you have loved at that age? And so to remember that, that actually that would have been amazing to have someone who would walk with me and who I could have been an apprentice to at that age and stage. But also just to think differently about efficiency. And I know it's easy for me to say I'm not primarily a business mind. So it's easy to say that. But then there are obviously all sorts of business realities that kind of push people towards focusing on efficiency. But that's just comes from an understanding of how creativity works, that it's not linear and that it involves a much more winding path. Um, one of the the guys I found very interesting to read on my master's research was Keith Sawyer. So he's at the intersection of learning creativity and collaboration. Um, and he he works in uh, higher education, but also consults with, with comp companies. But what he draws on especially is his experience in jazz. So he's a jazz pianist. Um, and, and he looked in great detail at the dynamics of 
um, jazz bands and improv theater to see, you know, how do people actually build together? Um, and I mean, that's interesting in itself, but, but one of his books is called, I think it's called Zigzag, but to make that, that point that, that the creative path is not going to be linear. And that's one of the things I'm finding very interesting actually now learning a more conventional coaching model for one-to-one is that, and I'm still learning and I'm still keeping an open mind, but it seems to me very linear. So I think in the end, I will need to, as and when I create, you know, my own services and and they will be a hybrid of that much more wandering around the houses for a of a better way of explaining it. Um, design thinking approach, although there is a system behind it uh, and the more linear and, and yeah. So I think that's the challenge, right? With the workplace and with taking the time to do inefficient things like allow someone to be your apprentice and facilitate their growth. Um, but I think it's also understanding the learning that comes from that kind of intergenerational engagement, which, which again is a core, I think it's in the IDGs, right? So the perspective taking, whether you, or you could even call it intercultural competence. If you think of the young, younger generation as another culture, which they are in a sense, it's, it's understanding the value of that, that we actually need that, that different perspective because the outsiders, with the beginner's mind will spot things that we miss because we've been here so long and because we know it all. Yeah. And you just said, so um, creativity is, is not efficient. And then you say, mm-hmm. uh, so, okay, that's, that's just the case. But I think it's just really important because the, the way that the world has been driven to efficiency, to, um, you know, improve jobs in a way that they become more efficient, improve work, improve machinery, improve everything around what we do to efficiency. And at the same time, we see that, I'm not saying there's a correlation, but at the same time, we see that people just get unhappier and unhappier. Mm -hmm. And if there's a great series on Netflix at the moment, which is Live to 100, um, which does a, a review of the blue zones in a world where people you know, live longer. And you can see that people work hard, um, manual labor. So mm-hmm. instead of just being more efficient, they just do manual labor. So not just mm-hmm. being efficient, but just being physical active. Um, mm-hmm. Probably also because in the areas that they are there, you know, it's very difficult to do everything with machines. Um, but also that's the way that it grew up. And what you see is that they work um just specific times of the day. And then they also have a lot of time to relax, to spend time with family and friends, to do dancing, have conversations. Um, so n- not efficient at all, I would say. <laughs> a lot of space to become creative. Um, yeah. Not maybe even creating something, but creating relationships or creating um you know, reading, like um, creating new insights, right? So, and that brings wellness, it brings happiness, it brings a lot more than just um, money. And mm-hmm. I think if you look at the IDGs, that, that's that's the direction I would uh, go for, right? Mm-hmm. If you look at your coaching work that you're working on, right? Mm-hmm. So how would you integrate the, inner development goals with that? I think, as I said, I'm, I'm kind of withholding judgment right now in terms of this more linear process that I'm learning. Um, so firstly, it's much more linear. And secondly, it's much smaller scale because it's one-to-one. I mean, that's the primary focus is one-to-one, the conventional coaching relationship. Although I think they will address group coaching later. Um, so I think for me, that will be the first thing that I need to tweak um is is to i think it will depend partly on the person right so i do think some people actually do want a more linear experience so i think it it will vary but i i think generally speaking we need to integrate um more exploration for example um unearthing values which is really important to coaching i think it's very difficult for someone if you just ask them what are your top 10 values even if you provide a list you know it's it's possible, but it's 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 quite difficult um, to unearth those things. And I think they come out much more effectively through things like storytelling. So scaffolding experiences that enable people to tell stories of 
um, people who inspired them, people who had a big impact on their life, and then unpick, you know, what exactly was happening there? What was it about that person that resonated with you, that inspired you? What values did they represent for you? You know, those kinds of activities, they're time consuming. But I do think in the end, so going back to efficiency, it maybe efficient is the wrong word. It's more meaningful, sustainable and useful um, to take the time to, to do the, that kind of storytelling or, you know, generating visual maps that these tapping into, as I would say, the head, heart and hands. So the heart and hands and not um, maybe even building. So Lego series players, another thing that I've used sometimes to kind of activate that that side of you know building something and using the visual and the physical rather than just the thinking um so sorry just uh, remind me the question i got off point something about how would i integrate creativity in, in no. coaching <clears throat> yeah the IDGs. Well, I, think, IDGs. I think that's oh sorry the idgs yeah so i think uh, let me have a look go back to them here so i think at first glance there's a few of them that are literally the same as the skills that are cultivated through the, the design thinking, which is my main influence. So that would be the learning mindset. So that's this idea of going as a beginner into situations and it's very closely connected to empathy. So it's a little bit different when you're designing your own life in a coaching situation because empathy for yourself is a strange, I mean, I guess you can talk about compassion, but they, they generally reframe that as curiosity rather than empathy. Um, but it's that, that idea of curiosity, but in other design settings where you are serving someone else, a community or another person, um, that learning mindset is really crucial to not go in assuming that you understand the problem, right? So that's the key point that the person you're serving is the expert on the problem or the challenge or whatever it is you want to design for. Um, then I think what comes in very naturally also is perspective skills under the thinking side. So that recognition that that we need diverse perspectives to come up with sustainable and useful solutions. And that diversity, there's so many different dimensions of it. So it could be professional diversity, it could be intellectual diversity, it could be personality, it could be education, discipline, ethnic background. I mean, there's there's so many different ways and all of them are useful because all of them bring different frame framings, different mindsets, et cetera. So that's a very natural fit with the IDGs. The other one, which to me was strange to read critical thinking. As I read it from left to right, it's very strange for me to read critical thinking before creativity, just because, again, the creative process is usually generative before it's critical. So it feels a bit backwards, but it's just the way, obviously it's framed here, is the critical thinking is a really key part of the creative process. And I think that's often misunderstood. We can associate creativity with the generative part, the blue skies thinking, the out the box, but actually none of that is going to be useful, particularly with a, a change making focus unless we evaluate it and work out okay we've done that part we've withheld judgment and we've done the crazy stuff and now we actually do need to judge we need to evaluate what's going to be useful here and then we need to go experiment so i think that's that's key in fact that's pretty much 50 percent of the creative process hmm. and then, um under the relationship part empathy and compassion i don't think we talk as much about compassion um in the sort of design narrative but i think it's implied by empathy, right? Understanding, like walking in the shoes of the people with whom you're trying to design a change. That's key. And again, going back to them being the expert um, around the challenge. Uh, and then co-creation, that would be, you know, an, a very natural fit with what, what I'm already doing in terms of the collaboration. So just the, the recognition that coming as an outsider, whether that's as a teacher or a coach or a consultant or whatever that might be, but the, the solution or the change, I think probably change is more helpful than solution in the kind of context that I'm in, but the, the change absolutely needs to be co-created with the people who um, want to make the change. And trust, I linked up trust there. I think, again, that's that's key, right? Because co-creation can't happen without trust. If, if people don't, if they think it's just lip service or we just kind of asking them questions to tick a box, which can happen, and I've seen that happen, um, then... It's, it's not really co-creation, right? So th there needs to be, the trust is built by a genuine understanding by everyone around the table that that we need to do this together. And then creativity is the big one, right? In the action. Um, so for me, it's strange to see it at the end, but I mean, I suppose that's the, that's the end game for me, but the creative thinking possibly I feel is missing under the thinking part, right? Because mm -hmm. for me, that's always hand in hand with critical. Um, you need, you need both. So, um, 
Well, there's a one question questionnaire now that you can add uh, skills that yeah, you think are maybe, missing. So maybe creative thinking as opposed to creativity, because it's part of. I mean, creativity is the result, right? Bringing something new and useful to the world, I think, is the definition in most places. But actually, yeah, it's just as important to me. It seems odd to have the critical thinking without the creative part because they need to be in balance. Yeah, and then some of them I'm, you know, less less familiar with or I emphasize less, but that's I think something I'm interested to do now, see how people are using them. Yeah, and, and which ones to focus on. I think that no, I'm gonna take this route because I've I've I see that you've been working with UNICEF for mm -hmm. a number of projects as a freelance. Yeah. Um yeah. and you talk about having an open mindset and learning from the people that you um, working with, co-creating with. Mm -hmm. And you've been to all these um, various areas to do the work for UNICEF. How do you feel about, and I, I, I don't know exactly what UNICEF is doing, so, but how do you feel about um, that is UNICEF going into an area and looking at the situation to maybe give advice from a Western kind of perspective, or am I just completely wrong here? I think the main framework that UNICEF use of what they call a human rights based perspective. So whether that's Western, I mean, yeah, I don't know, actually, that's an interesting question. Like, is it so is a human rights lens, which is what they that's the probably dominant lens to which all their work is seen. Um, I don't know if that's Western, um, or if that's just human. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I think I would need to do more research myself in terms of the evolution of a human rights based approach. But that's that's the the kind of touchstone that they refer to the most. And with that, I, I obviously, education and life skills is the area I'm most familiar with. What that means in practice is things like um, ensuring equitable access. But actually, there's three main pillars. So equitable access is the first, because if you're not accessing education, then that it's quality or anything else is irrelevant. So access is the first um, quality. So is it actually developing the kind of skills that are needed in the workplace? Um, and I think that that is, there is an understanding that that's also culture specific and there is an, a, a, an effort always to um, contextualize any initiative. So the human rights based one, I think they would see as globally relevant, um, but that does sometimes clash with local cultural practices. And that's where I think the discernment comes in. Uh, is this a case for contextualization or is it a case for pushing back with a human rights based perspective? So, for example, something like it's not something I have experience with because it's more a, a child protection and education issue, but FGM, so female genital mutilation, that would be something where I think the UN would say they don't want to be culturally sensitive because they see it as a human rights issue but there are many other issues where they do see it as a something that where the context is is you know should prevail um and then the third kind of pillar um in education but also across their work is what's called system strengthening or systems building so that again i think is relevant to your question because the unicef model and and i speak as an outsider but obviously working um for many years alongside um UNICEF employees, but their model is to work hand in hand with government. So the government um, and other civil society partners and other UN partners, but above all, kind of in tandem with government. So to collaborate with them, to learn from them, to learn with them, to build capacity where, where that's relevant. So I think that's where quite naturally things would be contextualized, but that's where I think, yeah, I, I don't have that kind of... Um, What's the kind of cutting edge experience of working with government? And to be honest, I think that's one of the issues. I think this is where we came in when we when we first met. I was kind of mentioning that I don't think that that's the scale that I'm happiest working with um, at government slash regional and global level. It's very interesting. And I'm very interested in thinking globally, in particular the issues around education and skill building, understanding what's going on around the world. But I don't think collaboration with government is my great you know my greatest strength or my you know place of greatest contribution put it that way I think that's why I'm very keen to much as I'd still like to be involved with the evaluation research etc particularly if it's participatory and more kind of design based um, I'm more interested in the individual and the group and 
probably people who are already focusing on people development so schools or people developers within the within, within a, a workplace context which isn't necessarily the focus of a government a government counterpart um so i'm not sure if i've answered your your question but i, I think it's it's both basically right so there are some global lenses and some non-negotiables from the unicef perspective in terms of human rights and equity and depending on the context for example the rights of girls to education um and then there are other issues where they recognize that their initiative i mean take the example of um fundu which is a a life skills chatbot which has been rolled out by the unicef office of innovation which is actually based in in sweden it used to be based at headquarters in new york but there's a lot of decentralization going on so i was involved recently in a review of how that's going around the world and again it's a hybrid so there there are there is global content that's generated centrally which any country is very welcome there's been a lot of interest from different countries and they're very welcome to use that so whether it's on mental health whether it's it's targeted at primarily um it's 10 to 25 but more for the 14 to 25 that kind of age bracket with life skills development which is exactly what i'm interested in but obviously hadn't historically been looked at it through a chatbot kind of medium but um you have the global content on mental health or on um, climate education or on um, employability for example um, and various activities that that help to develop um, understanding and skills building in those areas but then the country team is encouraged to work with young people and genuinely co-create so to, to get their feedback on the material and on the, the pathway the learning pathway and contextualize it you know the language doesn't work or that activity doesn't work or i mean just a basic example from the team in jamaica the language didn't work you know they needed to have more of the jamaican dialect they needed to um literacy levels in some of the context is an issue so they need to reframe the language so those kinds of things are going on so it, it's a bit of both so um developing what are called like global goods but um contextualizing them as needed with some non-negotiables from the human rights side mm -hmm. i can understand yes and i know if you have the book drawdown um I think in the top three, there are two parts of education um, mm -hmm. to really influence uh, the future of the of the planet uh, more in a sustainable way, and way that is educating women, um, mm -hmm. young um, women, and I think mm -hmm. it, it's really important to do that. So to me, that sounds very logical. Mm -hmm. um, to to ask you a question that you mentioned before, mm -hmm. who is your big um, source of inspiration or um, example? Oh, there are a few, I think. Do you mean so, um, kind of personally or in my thinking or in my work or any? Okay, so you want any, any of the above? Okay, so I would say probably practically in terms of the work I'm involved in, um, the kind of designing your life, that duo, so Dave Evans and... Bill Burnett, I've been really inspired by them. I find their stuff really helpful because it's applying, as I said, the, the kind of mindset of design thinking, but to wayfinding, not just your I mean, life, but also decision making and career wayfinding. So I found their their way of applying that really helpful. Um, I do think as as with anyone, as with me, I, don't, I think there are some blind spots, you know, obviously being from the same culture, being the same age, et cetera. So same gender, I think um, I, li I like to get people's feedback on, on what they're missing, but I found that them very helpful. Um, I think in terms of understanding creativity, um, Chik Chik Mahai, the crazy, uh, it's a very difficult name to spell, but a uh, Hungarian American um, specialist in creative prose, because he's the guy that uh, first no. talked about flow. Yeah, exactly. So I found his work very helpful and interesting. Um, Keith Sawyer on the the jazz. So I think of that often. So I think that's one of one of the main things I took away and that I apply very practically is his under, his description of creativity as collaborative, improvisational, and emergent. So that helps me often to understand why something isn't working because I I can see okay that maybe the collaboration's there but there isn't room for improvisation. There isn't room for emergence. Helps me understand why I think. The government isn't my favorite place. I, d I think there probably isn't a huge amount of room for improvisation and emergence. Um, 
in that space. So maybe it's required. Um, maybe they need it really. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't happen, right? So that um Elizabeth Gilbert actually, um mm. I liked her book Big Magic. You know, I, I draw from a lot of very different places and, and and always, you know, with a critical lens, I don't take on all of it, but I, I love her emphasis on creativity as something, as I mentioned before, to be reclaimed as just part of the human experience. Like, guys, it's what we've done forever. We've solved problems. We've made stuff um, to essentially democratize it. You know, it's not for the special people. And she's very good on some of the limiting beliefs or what the design your life guys call dysfunctional beliefs, the things that stop us doing um, our best work or our most creative work. Um, I also like her distinction between hobby, job, career, and vocation. I find that very helpful. Often when we're getting in a mess, particularly around this passion narrative, she's very good at like separating some of those strands. Um, yeah, a lot on the tech. Um, we went, we were talking a bit about tech before, but you know, the intersection of tech and creativity, I find Cal Newport really helpful on focus. So on, he's very interesting, a young technologist who doesn't have a social media account. Um, and again, yes, yeah, he's keen to point out he still has a professional life. He still has friends. He's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I like his stuff. Very kind of clear thinker. And uh, Sherry Turkle, I think she might be almost retiring now from MIT on empathy. Um, and particularly, she's another technologist, but the importance of conversation so live and unscripted uh, and all the ways that that builds empathy and all the ways it's being shut down um so i like her work uh yeah so quite wow. a, quite a few um yeah uh, and recently actually i got this one right here johan hari so i'm reading his book on he's a british journalist on a book called stolen focus um so he's it's quite a holistic look at you know some things we talked about earlier around how um the broken business model of tech is is shutting down some of our creative behaviors and he just makes the basic point that for most of us anything important that we've ever done whether that's a raising a raising a child um starting a business learning how to play an instrument it's taken a significant degree of focus um and and looking at all the ways that that's being destroyed, you know, left, right, and not just not just by tech. It's it's very interesting because he he does talk about the broken business model um, and the implications of that, but also some other just general trends in terms of how information flows, how we work, how we eat, uh, lots of different issues which are harming our ability to to focus and get the good stuff done. Hmm. Yeah. So that's that's quite a list. <laughs> oh, and it's great resources yeah. because it gives me also inspiration yeah. to look at newer yeah. things that I haven't looked at. So I like that. Mm -hmm. That's why I I love the question. Yeah. I didn't ask it before, but I like I like it now. Um, so if people want to learn more about your work and want to learn how you could help them with um, facilitation of creating and creative problem mm -hmm. solving and you know everything that we talked about, how did they get in contact with you? Uh, so at the moment it is LinkedIn. Yeah, as we talked about before, I'm not on a lot of platforms um, deliberately uh, at the moment, although that may change. So, yeah, LinkedIn for the moment, and I am will I will be putting together a fairly basic website uh, in the next few months. Yeah, I'm working with a friend on that. So, and I'll I'll link that up with LinkedIn. So that's the best place for now. Yeah. So I'm going to put the link of LinkedIn of your LinkedIn profile on the episode and the notes so that people can directly click to it. Um, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for this nice conversation and learning about, you know, your experience, but also the ideas of um, creativity and about, um, you know, let's get back to experimenting and um, finding ways to experiment into a new life, maybe even, right? Designing your yeah, life exactly. I, yeah, think, you got it. <laughs> I think it's really interesting yeah. to learn and also i like the part about creative confidence um mm -hmm. in in relationship what you mentioned there before was when you um you know get out of the career trap mill that you also lose a lot of those confidence that came with the um the business card or the title right so yeah yeah um, thank you very much thank you i know it's been great i really enjoyed it thanks for inviting me